the answers from the quiz. Number one, the islands off the coast of Alaska are long and skinny. Remember, we looked at the map, and we have the coast, and we have these islands like this. <clears throat> they form because, which one makes most sense? A subduction. Now, what is subduction? Yes, yeah, sliding underneath. <laughs> you got my hand signal. <laughs> Why would it be A and not D? Okay, D is separate. Divergence is separate. Yeah. And this was caused by the ocean plate sliding underneath and scraping stuff off of the ocean floor to make the islands, not by being pulled apart. Okay, which of the following features, well, that one's supposed to happen, is formed where one plate subducts under another at a converging boundary? So we just had subduction. The previous one is the answer. Now, what other feature, because these are not the same feature, occurs at that location? D, the ocean trenches, things like the Marianas Trench or the Tonga Trench that we had in your picture yesterday. Those are formed because you had the material coming down and pulling this down with it and making a trench. And as we talked about, the material then that was in the ocean floor that subducts, it goes down into the mantle, gets recycled. And so the mantle is recycling stuff that was in the crust. Um, number three, what drives the hydraulic cycle? Go back to our walk on the dam. And we talked about it again later, but what drives it? It's both the sun and gravity. The sun heats up the water, makes it evaporate and go up to the sky. So that's why the sun is part of it. Gravity makes it fall down. That's why it's the other part. And then our final question in geology what is the principle of superposition? This is really important for how we interpret geologic layers. Okay. When one geologic layer is laying on top of another, the top one is younger. That is correct. Now, these that was a very poor circle. That's a somewhat better, not circle, but you know what I mean, oval. Some locations are primed for creating and preserving geologic layers. True statement. Where are you likely to have sedimentation occur? In deltas. Deltas might be an example. Somewhere where we are underwater usually because water brings the sediment, drops it. Now, deltas would actually be a situation where you don't exactly follow the answer for C. We have the principle of original horizontality that says that those sediment layers are, are originally made flat. That's what would occur in a large seafloor. And when we look at the ocean, we have those abyssal plains, which I, I may have taken out the... Yeah, it was, uh, it was up there an option for part two. The abyssal plains, the large flat regions, that's the kind of environment where we expect sediment to be forming for the majority of what we see in the geologic column. So the, the principle of original horizontality says that when we look at layers, strata, in the geologic column, we interpret them to have originally been laid out horizontally unless we have some other evidence to suggest, you know, like if it's a delta, then it wouldn't be perfectly horizontal problem. Um, this last one is also a true statement. All geologic layers combine to form the geologic column. The geologic column is the name we give for all of the different layers that we find in sedimentation. But only one of them was a correct answer for the principle of superposition. Now, on this note, I'm going to forward to you today an article. I can't remember what, what magazine it was from. It's a pretty long article. I forwarded it to my wife thinking, wow, this is really cool. You know, it, it shows you evidence that it can be easily interpreted as congruent with a, a flood model. 
my wife read it, and of course, it's written by somebody who believes in evolution and the long uniformitarian things. And so she read that, and she was like, "Well, it'd be good if you're, you know, trying to teach evolution." And so I'm going to send it to you. I think you'll find it interesting if you have the patience to read through it. It's a long article, but it talks about the KT boundary, or and it even says why it's recently been changed to the KPG because tertiary has been changed to plagiogene, I think is what it was. Um, but it talks about fossils discovered in that region, and it has some really interesting things like finding freshwater and saltwater fish right next to each other, indicating they both died together in the same region. But of course, saltwater fish and freshwater fish can't live in the same water. And so you would have had to have had, go ahead, say that loud, Bryce. Flood. You'd have to have had a flood situation. Now, a localized flood could explain that, but it has a lot of other things that are really interesting dealing with that. That, well, I'll probably in my email preface with how the data that is interpreted one way by uniformitarianist scientists could be interpreted a different way by young earth creationist scientists. The data still is the data, it's what you find when you dig it up. And are you enjoying? <laughs> Not as much as I was a minute ago. I didn't say no, but I just closed it. Um, don't need nags in the middle of lecture. The nag screens are a nuisance, which is why they're called nag screens. All right, so let's get back to our lecture material. So picking up where we left off last class, we're dealing with the oceans. I'm not going to get to weather. We're just going to finish off with the oceans today. I will make sure I have a review for the exam up by tonight. Um, review over the different. It's impossible to review everything that we've covered in a what, three week period in one document. So it's not like you're going to say, oh, I'll have every question on the test covered by this material. But I'm trying to re remind you of the important things that we've covered. Question Amber. Um. So you said you're taking weather out, so we won't be accepted to make that stuff. That's correct. What time can I be here? What time can you expect it? Yeah. Um, let's say before 5 p.m. Okay. So it's not, can I be like... Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. No, it's good to be reminded. Um, I won't consider it nagging like that nag screen because it's something that is important. I'm just saying, because it's on Friday, it's kind of freaking me out that the thing isn't up there yet. Okay, well, it, it will. It will be soon. And we will be reviewing in class on Wednesday. All right. So we ended last class period talking about waves. And I'm just going to go past the wave here and talk about some of the cool features that are caused by waves. Notice we talked about the circular pattern. It doesn't have to be circular for the motion of the water. And this shows as the water gets shallower, you start to have it slow down and you get this elliptical motion for the waves and that creates these breakers. And as was first mentioned by Bryson, wind will also play a part. Like if wind is blowing, if wind is blowing this way, what's that going to do to the waves? I don't think it'll make them smaller um, because the, the height of the wave largely has to do with the energy that's being brought in. But at this point, what it's going to do is push the tops back up. So they're not going to break as early because you have wind resisting that going faster on top. So it probably will make them actually grow a little higher and break a little later. If the wind was blowing the other direction, they would break earlier and not grow as tall. So the wind is going to affect these. Now, when you, when you said choppier, the um, out in the ocean where these are being created, if you have more wind, it's going to make it choppier. And that's going to extend too when we get to the shore as well. So yes, you are going to have that effect as well. That, that is just not what I'm going for. Okay. Now, how many people enjoy the ocean and the beach? 
Okay, I'm glad to have a good representation. I love the beach, which is why the rest of this lecture is probably dealing with the beach and what's going on there. So one of the first things, the beach is defined by the place where you have sand. If you don't have sand, it's not a beach, right? Okay. It could be a beach if it's like rocky, isn't it just like where the... Well, rock, okay. Rock, I suppose, would also be a beach. But if you just have water and then you have a cliff, that's oh, yeah, not yeah. Sand. But I was like, there's lots of places that are beaches. Yeah, you, you, you have Pebble Beach, the famous Pebble Beach. Um, it's not so fun to hang out on Pebble Beaches, though, especially if you're tenderfoot like me. Those rocks hurt. <clears throat> so when the water comes in, it's going to bring in sand, and that's what creates the beach, is the ocean bringing in the sand. If the water goes to the side, so if you have waves that are coming in like this, then when they come to the surface, because they have a component that's inward and a component that's parallel to the beach, they're going to have an effect to drag sand. They're going to drag sand the direction of the component that's parallel to the beach. And so in this picture, because the water is coming in at an angle to the beach, it's going to drag the sand along. So you have more sand on this side and less on this side because it pulled it over. So waves come in different directions depending on your wind directions. And so you will have the sand distribution shift over time depending on wind and water currents. These, <clears throat> notice here we have waves coming in. See how the waves are changing direction as they come into the ocean, or as they come into the shore, I mean? Got to change colors. That's the same one as they have. So here we have a wave curves into the surface. And so this actually works to help us develop these things. Headlands are the things that stick out, where the land sticks out. So when somebody talks about going to the headlands, they're talking about going to places where you have land jutting out into the ocean. And then beside those headlands, you have bays. So I grew up in Monterey Bay Academy, which is somewhere around there on the Monterey Bay, if that was the Monterey Bay, or coves that are a smaller version of a bay. So these are features. Go ahead. What is the difference between a cove and a bay? Like um, a cove, I believe, is smaller. I think that's the difference. No, go ahead. I said I thought. I didn't say I know. Okay, so here's, here's something very reminiscent of where I grew up. In fact, if you were to just flip this, actually, yeah. You guys probably don't know Santa Cruz beaches, but we had our, like, 7th, 8th grade um, parties down here at the beach where at Sea Cliff you have an arch like that. Or actually, it wasn't Sea Cliff Beach. It's uh, Natural Arches, I think is the name of it. But you have arches like this where you had a headland, right, something that was jutting out, and the water kept eroding that headland until it was something narrow and eroded a notch through it. And so you have this here. This cliff used to probably come out here, and the water has eroded it away. And, of course, as you see, landslides, gravity takes over. If you have waves that come up and crash and dig out the bottom of these cliffs, the overload is going to come sliding down. And so those are going to happen. Now, these pictures here, I hide that. This here is Monterey Bay Academy, for those who don't know it. So if you've ever heard of Rainbow Fin Company, that's Rainbow Fin Company. Um, back here is a barn that I helped to build when I was a freshman in high school. This is the airstrip I used to have to mow when I was in high school. But most important, this is the beach, which I'm not going to name because you can definitely tell where the beach is. Something that is probably going to vary from state to state, but that is actually reasonable to know is what belongs to who. We have signs on the beach. If you could see it, there is a sign planted right here that says private property. But you know what? It's not really. 
California zoning laws require that the beaches are public access. You can't have a private beach and you can't block people from coming to the beach. It's a big thing like movie stars try to put barricades to keep people from accessing a beach. They'll put up fake signs and stuff because they want to have a private beach, but they're public. Yeah. Is that the same for like when you go to a resort? Yeah. Because aren't there? If it's in California, yes. Oh, just in California? Oh, just in California? Not in like. Yeah, I, I can't. The US as a whole? I can't say for sure. I, for our second wedding anniversary, Amy and I were in Cozumel. And we went to a beach that was very rocky as soon as you got to the water. And right beside it, they had taken all the rocks out at a more expensive resort. So I spend more time in the more expensive resorts, beach area, because like I said, I'm tenderfoot. Okay, so why am I showing you this? Well, what do we have right here? Can you tell what that is? Yes, it's a drop off. We call it the bluff. And I mean, it's been steeper, it's been shallower. Um, depends on landslides. You can see that there's been some landslide down here and it's shallower when you have the landslide and then the ocean clears it up. The, um, what, what is private is I think from the high water line up is private. That amount is private, <laughs> but this amount is public. So I don't know, it, it's near and dear to my heart, but there are other things to point out. Sometimes, and this year was one of those years, there is a rock formation right here that gets uncovered. Why would that rock, rock formation be uncovered periodically? Well, it's under the sand right now. So the, the, water, the water level, I suppose that is relevant because if no waves are getting to there, then it's not going to be changing much. But if waves are getting there, so the water level is high enough, and you know, tides do go up and down throughout the day. The waves drag the sediment away. The waves drag the sediment away. What kind of situation is going to remove sand? Um, Weather-wise. Okay, windy would blow sand. Is it where? The sun is. Um, the moon. I think you're getting to, to the tide concept. Yeah. The tide concept affects it, but the, the, the large erosion occurs when we have what we call storm surge. When you have a storm, not only does it blow the water up higher, you know, you just have more energy in the waves. The more energy in the waves means that the faster the water moves, the more it picks up, the less it deposits. So you're going to have a net erosion when you have fast moving waves. And so when you have a big storm, and as you probably know, there were big storms everywhere the last few months, not just here in Nebraska. And in California, those storms caused this to wash away so those rocks were visible again. <laughs> and this is just a picture that allows you to see the bluff a little better. You see the, the bluff back here. And no, it's pretty big, yes. And as a child, I had nightmares about a tsunami coming over the bluff and me running and trying to get away from it. And how how tall is the bluff? Like, would it have to be like a really big tsunami? Oh yes, the, this bluff is I don't know, easily a hundred feet tall. That's good. <laughs> um. So keeping on, here's some more things that can develop. So what do we call this thing right here? Uh, headland. Yes. So there's a headland. Now this is focusing on other things. A spit is where you have a piece of, of sand that has formed a barrier, but not a complete barrier. So it's a, a sandbar, if you will. What, what would cause that sandbar to form? Uh, a... What do you call it? 
things that most people aren't seeing. If we have the waves coming in at an angle, they're going to drag the sand sideways. And so when you have the headland, you drag the sand sideways over the headland, you can start forming that spit. And if the spit completely covers from one, one headland to the next, then you get a lagoon. And this thing out here is called a barrier island in that case because it's now covering and being a barrier between the ocean and the lagoon. So a spit is formed when this sand is doing what? When it's being dragged sideways. Remember back to this picture here. So if you have a headland here and the... Okay, why is it not drawing now? Well, lost my ability to draw. But if it's being dragged sideways and you have a headland, it draw, drags out in front of the following bay. I hope I can draw again now. Now, other things you have in the ocean, things like coral reefs. I don't know if anyone's been like skin diving at Hanama Bay or something similar. Well, what I learned from going to Hanama Bay, and I think that was coral there, it might have been lava rock, whatever it was, it was super sharp. Um, coral is an organism. It's an animal that secretes a shell, if you will, and that shell is the coral. And then the, um, the, the animal, the worm-like thing, lives in that coral. So it's secreting calcium carbonate. We've called calcium carbonate by a few names. Do you remember other names for it? <clears throat> calcium carbonate is the chemical name. So just reviewing from our chemistry, what does calcium carbonate mean in terms of chemical form? Okay, calcium carbonate means, I believe it's CO4. So calcium carbonate is calcium and carbonate bonded together. And names that we've called that are calcite or limestone. Different names depending on how it's formed. So here it's just called calcium carbonate. It's actually the same type of thing as your shells of most sea creatures because there's lots of carbon dioxide that gets assimilated into calcium carbonate because of the calcium floating around in the ocean water. So it's a salt that forms from those calcium and the carbonic acid. So these, these coral form big reefs, and those reefs are a home for lots of fish and sea life. So they're important for the health of the sea, for the health of the things that live in the ocean. And how do you see these in the news today? I see coral reefs in the news today. Coral bleaching that's right, that's my last line. Coral bleaching is an indicator of global warming. As the temperature warms up, it's going to decrease the formation of the calcium carbonate, and it's going to modify it so that it actually kills the poor coral. And so the coral reefs die. They stop producing more coral reef. And so that's one of the real problems that we have with the raising, rising temperatures that have been experienced in the last, I don't know how long. Now the tides. The tides is something that has been alluded to a number of times. The tides are caused by differential gravitation. That is, force of gravity we learned a long time ago is G M1 M2 over R squared, where R is the separation. M1 is the mass of object one, M2 is the mass of object two. And so we've learned from this that when things are closer together, the gravitational force is stronger. When they're farther apart, the gravitational force is weaker. What direction is the gravitational force always going to be? Okay, for Earth, that's how you find down, so that's a fair answer. What, what was it you were gonna say, Grace? Attractive. Attractive is what I was looking for in this question. The difference in down versus attractive is where your perspective is. 
if we're standing on the surface of the Earth, the only gravitational force that's strong enough for us to interact with that we can tell is there is the Earth's gravitation. And so that's why we sit down. But there is a gravitational force between us and the Sun. And it turns out it's much stronger than the force between us and the Earth. But it's also acting on the Earth and making the Earth move the same direction we are because of that force, so we don't realize it's happening to us. But it's that force and the force between the Moon and the Earth that makes tides. So differential, here it says the word differences. We have water on this side of the Earth. Okay, I'm going to change color again because of the lack of contrast. Water on this side of the Earth and water on this side of the Earth. So we have radius to the near side and radius to the far side. So just looking at the lines, it's clear. Radius to the far side is a longer distance. But what does that tell you about the force between the moon and the water on the far side of the Earth compared to the force between the water on the near side of the Earth and the moon? Which one's stronger? The near side. The near side is stronger. So what happens, and this is, it seems crazy, is that there is a stronger force. That's why this arrow here is longer than this arrow. There's a stronger force due to gravity on the side of the Earth that's closest to the moon and a weaker force of gravity on the side of the Earth that's farthest from the moon. And so force, it's attractive, it's pulling. And so the water on this side of the Earth is being pulled toward the moon harder than the Earth is on average. So that water gets elongated, gets pulled away from the Earth. On the far side of the moon, the Earth is getting pulled harder than that water is. And so the water gets left behind and it's elongated again. So we have high tides on both sides of the Earth, the side closest to the moon and farthest from the moon. Now I unthinkingly did not load this up. It was one of my plans before starting class was to load this up. Um, um, map, planet, orbit simulator, maybe. No, it's, it's, but that'll get me at least close. I hope that they're still working on this tablet because last time I tried, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna load it up on that computer and then put that on the screen so we can see it. Because I have, I have the Nebraska astronomy, whatever it is. Um, they have actually a great simulator. Odd that I tried to click on it and failed. NAAP class action module list. Lunar cycles. Full screen, please allow. Okay. Tidal bolt simulator. All right, so here we have a simulator. Why is this water bulging out toward the moon? It's attracted more than the Earth is on average. Why is this water bulging out away from the moon? It's not attracted as strongly as the average Earth. 
The reason is because closer is attracted more strongly, farther is attracted more weakly. So this is a static picture, but what does the Earth do? It rotates. So we have the Earth rotating, and so we have the Earth rotating, we have the moon going around. You see the high and low tides are following the moon. Well, that's great, but that's not everything. So I'm going to stop it right here. So the water is not actually moving, it's the earth moving from the water. There's a little of both. But so next I'm going to include the sun, and then I'm going to include the effects of the earth's rotation, which is the, the answer to that. So the sun. The sun has a stronger gravitational force on us than the moon. How do we know such things? Well, we can calculate the mass of the moon, or mass of the, yeah, moon, the mass of the earth, mass of the sun, mass of the earth, separations. We can use that force equation. So the sun is a stronger force. So one might expect with a stronger gravitational force from the sun, we should have a stronger tidal force from the sun. But what makes the high tides? It's not just gravitational force. What is it? Texting each other? No. <laughs> Why would you say that? <laughs> the answer is... <laughs> What was my question before? <laughs> okay. What makes the tides? It's not just the gravitational force. It's. Go ahead. You said besides the moon, that's what your question was. Well, it's, it's not just the gravitational force, it's something else along with the gravitational force. What's the difference that makes it so the gravitational force causes high tides and low tides? Aquaman is not it. Uh, <laughs> it's distance. The gravitational force is stronger on the side that's closer and weaker on the side that's farther. And so you have, of course, the same distance change with the moon as you do with the sun. But as a percentage, the width of the earth is a very, very small percentage of the distance from the earth to the sun. And so the percentage change in gravitational force for the sun from one side of the earth to the other is small. For the moon, it's a much bigger percentage change. And thus, the moon makes a much bigger difference. So I'm going to turn on now the effects of the sun. So right now, I have the moon is causing a high tide, as you see. Now, if I turn on the sun, the sun is going to be horizontal. So we'll see what difference that makes. So it definitely made a difference, right? In this case, the sun is trying to make a high tide here and a high tide here the opposite size that the moon is trying to make high tides. And so you can directly observe that the moon high tide difference is bigger than the sun high tide difference because they're perpendicular to each other. They're working against each other. Now I'm going to run this and what's going to happen when the sun and moon line up. So they're both trying to make high tide in the same place. Actually an eclipse is this right geometry? Um, you don't have the eclipse, but rarely because the moon is tipped about five degrees from the plane that the um, Earth orbits the sun. So here, where the sun and Earth and moon all fall in a straight line, you have really big high tides. And so we call this situation a spring tide. Spring tide is the name for when you have the sun, Earth, and moon lined up and you get the biggest high tide. And those low tides are the reaches in between where the water's, you know, if you pull the water out here, it's got to go away from somewhere. And so the reaches in between are where you have low tides. And so you have the largest high tides and the largest low tides, right? So the biggest differential when you have the sun and moon lined up together. Now I'm going to keep running this around. And we'll get back to a 90 degree angle between the sun, earth, and moon. And what's happening to the size of the high tides now? Getting smaller. In this orientation where it's a 90 degree angle, that's the smallest high tide variation you're going to have. The smallest difference between high tide and low tide. And that's called a neap, N-E-A-P, a neap tide. So neap tide is when you have... 90 degree angle between the sun, earth, and moon. High tide when they're in a line. So I'm going to keep going. Whoops.
keep going around for another quarter cycle. What is going to happen to the size of the tides when the moon is between the sun and the earth? Okay, we have a prediction. Was the prediction correct? Okay, the low tides are the lowest they get and the high tides are the highest they get. What do we call this condition? Started right. No, this is well, 180. You started right, Bryce. What was it? Anyway, spring tides. So, spring tide doesn't matter if the moon is between the sun and the earth or the earth is between the sun and the moon. If they form a straight line, then you have your highest possible high tides. What phase is the moon then? Full moon or new moon is when you're going to have the highest high tides and the lowest low tides. Core or First quarter and third quarter is a half moon. So half moons are when you're going to have the smallest difference between high tide and low tide. So then full moon or no moon is when you have the... The largest tides. Now I have to add one more thing, and this is going to what Bryson said. The earth is rotating. And so the earth rotating means that the earth is pulling the water along with it, right? The water is going around as the earth goes around. Unlike flat earthers who say that the water should stay stationary and the earth should spin underneath it. There is this thing we call friction, and it occurs with liquids too. And so the tides are pulled by the earth's spin. So the earth is spinning in this picture, spinning counterclockwise, just based on the, where we're viewing from. And so if the earth is spinning counterclockwise here, what's that going to do to the high tide position? It's going to shift slightly. It's going to drag it the direction the Earth is rotating. So on the effect of rotation, you see that we have the high tide is actually out there ahead of the moon and sun. Well, the moon primarily. It's ahead because the Earth's rotation is pulling it ahead. So now if I let it run, we have the high tide is continuously just a little bit ahead of the moon. Now this, it's called tidal friction, by the way, the thing that makes that happen. But it ends up with something really bizarre. Because there's an attractive force between the Earth and the Moon due to gravity, and we have that bulge is out in front of the Moon, this is happening exactly like if I take my bomb on a string. You remember this from long ago. Right? It... it if I just swing it around, it'll, it'll stop over time, right? But if I move my hand so I'm slowly pulling it around, I can keep it going. Well, the moon doesn't have air resistance to slow it down, so it would generally just keep going. But because the Earth is pulling on it, it's going faster and faster and faster. And as it goes faster and faster and faster, it's my watch off. As it goes faster and faster and faster, it's gaining energy. And as it gains energy, it moves away from us. So the moon is moving away from us in about a quarter of an inch a year. So a long time eventually? A very, very, very long time. And of course, the amount that it moves away will decrease as it gets farther away. Does that mean tides get smaller? Yeah. But, but the rate is very, very small. It's not like this is anything you're ever going to notice a difference in your lifetime. I was going to say the moon looks closer a lot of the time. Like when I see it, it looks closer. Isn't that just atmospheres? Well, atmosphere and what you have to compare it to are two primary things that affect how big it appears or how close it appears. Um, if the moon is on the horizon, it appears bigger to most people because they're now comparing it to objects and they know the size of those objects and it appears bigger. Whereas up in the sky, they don't have objects to compare it to, and they perceive it as smaller. Um, and of course, like I said, atmosphere is going to make a difference as well. Okay, so obviously I find that an important topic since we spent a fair amount of time on the tides. It's the kind of thing that if you're teaching, you know, grade school. Students, if you have oceans, um, might be attuned to. If you're in Nebraska, maybe not so much. Um, 
why do we have high tides approximately 12 hours apart? It takes 24 hours for the Earth to do one rotation. And how many high tides are we going to have for a rotation? Why? Because. One on the side closest to the moon, one on the side farthest from the moon. And so if you take the 24 hours divided by two, you get 12. It's not exactly 12 because, of course, the moon is orbiting the Earth. And so you have to take that into account as well. So that's, that's why the high tide and low tide don't come at the same time every day. So I've covered this in all of its glory. Last thing for today, components of the Earth's atmosphere. This says 78% nitrogen. I know I've been saying 79%. Um, I don't think anyone's going to be too concerned about that. Notice the air is almost completely nitrogen and oxygen. Very small amounts of other things. Argon. Nobody talks about argon. Argon's a noble gas that's in that last column of the periodic table. By now, you're probably recognizing we're using lots of ideas that we've developed in our physics and chemistry sections as we go through geology because it's built on physics, the fundamental science, and chemistry, what do you call it, the ubiquitous science? <laughs> we didn't talk about importance. They're both very important. Okay, so we have nitrogen and oxygen are the primary components of the atmosphere. What does nitrogen do for us? Does it have something to do with the UV? Well, I mean, for bodies living. Oh. It's kind of a trick question because the answer is really nothing. It's, it's not something that's important to us. It's, it is important, though, that it's not harmful to us. Oxygen, well, that's very important. That is a primary reactant for our, our bodies to metabolize and to convert energy from fat or protein or carbohydrates into something usable. We need the oxygen for that, so that is very important to us. Then we go down argon, neon, helium, methane, hydrogen. You see very, very small amounts of these. Water, vapor... Water vapor varies. Some days it's humid, you have a lot of it. Some days it's not humid, you have little. Carbon dioxide. What's been happening to the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere? It's been rising. It's been rising. What does that mean for you and me as just our lives, not the lives of things around, how it's going to affect the future? We're doomed. We're doomed. We're doomed. <laughs> Okay, we are breathing out carbon dioxide. It's part of our waste. The carbon dioxide doesn't really hurt us at all. Carbon monoxide, by the way, does hurt you because it displaces oxygen on the hemoglobin. So if you breathe carbon monoxide, it will attach that hemoglobin and it won't. Don't put that down for your potential test question. <laughs> it, it, it attaches the hemoglobin and it won't release. And so that means you have less capacity to bring oxygen to your cells. That's the danger with carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and you see carbon monoxide's down there is a very minor component. But for plants, what does it mean that carbon dioxide? That's what they breathe in. That's what they need. So as carbon dioxide levels increase, what does that mean for plants? They get happier. They grow bigger. They grow more quickly. Everything is better for the plants with carbon dioxide going up. But isn't that what this saying is that we need to decrease putting out is CO2? Um, yes. Because eventually it's because yeah. the level of CO2 is rising and the concern is with the greenhouse effect. Remember we talked about that in physics. The greenhouse effect is gases that are absorbing infrared radiation. But that just make the plants grow better? It does make the plants grow better. And the supply trap will get really big. That's that's not really the concern. <laughs> but the concern is that you have certain animals and plants will lose their habitats if the temperature rises. And so we're changing. And, and, and certain plants and habitats, places like you know, New Orleans, 
New Orleans, which is already below sea level, is just going to become a less and less safe place to live as it goes further and further below sea level as sea levels rise. So that's why the concern is there. Okay. Is time to go? 